Thank you. We now have 30 minutes for questions. Um, the organizer, Mike, told me we could go six minutes longer since he took six minutes. And we have 30 minutes. Um, I'm instructed to tell you, first, uh, there will be a roving mic with a mic. And um, when you've asked your question, when you've asked your question, please give it back to Mike, the mic, back to Mike. Um, the objective is to ask as many questions as possible. We might think this is quantity over quality, but we can also think of it as um, a request that we get to the nub of the matter quickly, that questioners also get to the nub. Yes or no's are good if they answer the question. Um, that means there will be no follow-up questions. That's why you're giving the mic back to Mike. So I'm going to try to uh, ask questions from different parts of the uh, auditorium. And as I sort of gaze at a part of the auditorium, Mike can go in that direction. And uh, students, as well as professors, are welcome to ask questions. Uh, Steve, let me add just one thing. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the fellow over in the corner here is not checking to see whether or not we're obeying the speed limit. Uh, this is being recorded, so uh, you should understand that when you ask the question, the question is going to be recorded as well. <laughs> That's just, just for full disclosure. Okay. I'd like to call on the person right in the center, in the second row. Um, you mentioned, I think rightly, very early on in your paper that it, there's no indication that God, with his two human creatures, is forming a family of any sort. I guess my question is, how might your reading of just specifically the Adam and Eve story change if you don't assume that God is supposed to be a parent in the story? Well, I was, I was, I was making an interpretive, uh, let's see, I was setting myself the exercise of taking a certain ubiquitous metaphor very seriously. There's a lot of talk about God loving us, and in particular, loving us in the way a, a father loves us. So um, I'd be interested in what other relationship you might suggest. I mean, I, I think he's treating them very badly, even if he's not their father. But, uh, but in particular, I was interested in that particular metaphor. There's a question in front here. Um, if God doesn't exist, then presumably the people who wrote the stories were not reporting exactly anything. So is your theory then that this is kind of a culture that really put child abuse and murder and stuff on a high pedestal? Um, again, I don't really know enough about the Bible to answer that, but I'll tell you what my impression is from, from reading it, that it sounds a lot like other um, primitive myths. Um, there's a lot of killing going on. There's a lot of in-group, out-group stuff. Gods are not particularly moral. They're just really, really powerful. You see that in, in, uh, in Greek mythology and Norse mythology. They're not paragons. Um, and, uh, you know, there's just, a, there's just a great deal about uh, who, who, who the, who, who, which peoples are favored by which gods, and the conflicts among the peoples are often uh, regarded as, as uh, you know, some kind of con reflecting some kind of conflict among, you know, within, within heaven seems to me it's, it's no, no worse than a lot of other stuff you get. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd be interested to hear from scholars about, um, you know, ways in which it's, it's different uh, from, other, from other myths. But, you know, a lot of really bad stuff happens in, in Greek mythology, which is the only other mythology I know even anything about. Um, Professor Stump, you're an important part. Won't you come up and be receptive to questions as well? Well, as long as you're going up, I'll ask you a question, Eleanor. Um, I have some sympathy for the way um, Professor Anthony read the text. And, um, and the sympathy is something like this. Uh, the early Hebrews probably read it roughly that way and probably believed it fairly literally and, and probably weren't all that convinced from the information they had that God loved them and were even tempted by prophets of Baal and other tempters and temptresses, and, uh, and they, they seem to have been real temptations for them, probably, or maybe because they, didn't, they weren't convinced that Yahweh loved them. 
Um, and, and, and so partly it it's, it's kind of bothers me that we have to wait till Robert Alter to tell us the truth of all this. Um, uh, but at any rate, for the, for the early Hebrews, it just seems like there's a kind of natural way that they probably read it. It took a long time to figure it out, even for them. Uh, and then you, that, I mean, that raises issues about divine love, too, if it took so long to figure it out. So I just wondered if you have a response to that. Well, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that we've got nothing good on the story of the creation of Eve until we get to Robert Alter. I mean, we have wonderful stuff on all these stories in the Jewish tradition. And uh, there's a long, long history of, of interpretation of uh, the biblical stories, all of which can be consulted with prophet. I would say, um, I would say in, in response to Professor Anthony's remarks on the, uh, on the point uh, of whether we need a PhD to understand this text, well, you know, there's layers and layers of understanding. I mean, there are some things anybody can understand without a PhD, but you know what? Hebrew, really, for non-native Hebrew speakers, Hebrew really does take some uh, higher education. So you're going to learn one set of things from this text if you know the original language, and another set of things uh, are if you don't. I mean, you're, you're going to miss something without the Hebrew. So um, that's what I would say about that issue, not that Robert Alter is the first one to show us anything, but that he just gives a very nice analysis of things you can find also in the Jewish tradition. As for the question what the ancient Israelites might have known or what they might have thought, I would say, where do we get this idea? I mean, where do we get this information? This is just so history. I mean, how do we know what the ancient Israelites thought? Did we happen to find it recorded somewhere? I mean, did they say to us, you know, when we read this stuff, we really think God is pretty rotten? And as for, as for the, um, I mean, I would say our evidence for what they thought is pretty largely our speculation about the very text we're trying to interpret. That's what I would say. But as for uh, the issue of their uh, repeatedly, um, as for the, the, the worry that they repeatedly seem to betray the Lord they love. I mean, I don't know. Is anybody here married? I mean, do you ever do things to the person you're married to that you feel really bad about later or can't really account for? I mean, this is not a story about their theory about God. This is a story about what human beings do to the people they love. That's what I would say. Thank you. Do we have some more questions? I'd like to see three hands up. Before I call on one, there's one. I want to see another hand, two, one third one. Three, okay. So let's start over in this uh, part. Mike. Since the uh, original questioner is not allowed to follow up, I'd like to, in a way, follow up on one of the earlier questions about how the reading of the um, Adam and Eve, Eve story might change um, if we ask why should we assume God is a parent. Um, I want to ask about the point that you make at a couple turns. Um, the comparison with Hector <coughs> Pegg turns on Adam and Eve being children, um, in particular apparently being minor children, and that's the analogy. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more. I mean, you pointed to one thing, namely the absence of knowledge of good and evil. Um, but can you say a little bit more about what role, how big of a role that plays in your analysis? Well, um, I tried to give a very close reading of that one story. And the reason I chose that story was the, was the um, parallel with Hecate Peg. It was striking to me. Um, and, and by the way, I, uh, I, I did think I defended my interpretation. I did it the way I used to do it when I interpreted texts, and that seemed, to be, that seemed to be what the people who interpreted things for a living expected me to do. I would try to get a surface reading and see if there was some ambiguity or unclarity, what hypotheses might, might, um, might explain the, uh, might make sense of everything, and then I would try to make the whole thing cohere. Um, so I wasn't doing a line-by-line -line reading. I was looking for something that was coherent, but I think my readings of the lines are not crazy. Um, at any rate, um, look, I was, I, I was 
I, I chose, I chose the, the trope of God as a father for two reasons. Um, one is that I constantly hear and read um, from um, people, from theists, that the gulf between God and human beings is so immense that we are, it's a greater gulf than the gulf that exists between um, uh, human parents and their children. So the, the kinds of limitations that we struggle with relative to God are just enormous. So I don't think that viewing, viewing human beings as children would be um, illegitimate or, or not in keeping with, with um, mainstream religious uh, interpretive tradition, um, even if I didn't, you know, even if we couldn't really press the analogy to the point of saying that God's relation to, to human beings is parental. Um, but the other thing was that it played a very important part in my, in my upbringing. Um, it was something that was emphasized a lot, um, that God was our father and that we could turn to him like we could turn to a human father um, in times of need, when we, when we needed advice, when we needed strength. Um, it was a really potent image for me. So that's, that's another reason that I chose that image. I think, look, the basic case is um, you're all familiar with these problematic passages, these problematic stories. Um, if, you, if you just read this text and you didn't have names assigned to the characters, you would not identify the main character as a particularly just or loving individual. 